know McLaren can build fearsome supercars. We know it can do lighter, agile sports cars, and it can do hypercars. We know McLaren can build hardcore track cars. But can it build a Grand Tourer? We're in the south of France, and we're going to find out. So what exactly is a McLaren GT? Where does it slot into the marketplace? Well, McLaren doesn't see it as a rival to something like a Ferrari F8 Tributo. It thinks it goes up against the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera, a Grand Tourer. However, it's still built from the same basic building blocks as McLaren's other cars. It uses the Monocell 2 carbon tub. It's got the same basic twin-turbo V8 engine, the same seven-speed dual-clutch gearbox. All of it adapted to suit not a supercar, but a Grand Tourer. This car doesn't use the trick interconnected hydraulic suspension arrangement found on the 720S. Instead, it uses conventional springs, dampers, and anti-roll bars like the Sport Series models. The Monocell 2 carbon tub has been adapted from the B-pillar backwards with a bespoke rear structure that improves storage space. You only need to glance at the McLaren GT to understand that it's not really the same as the company's other models. There's more mass about the bodywork. It sits a bit higher off the road with more ground clearance. And whereas a McLaren 600LT, say, or a 720S, both of those cars are very lithe looking things with shrink-wrapped bodywork, this GT has much more mass about the way it looks, and that's all about storage capacity. Now have a look at this. This is a McLaren, remember, with a powered tailgate. How unusual is that? In total, the GT offers 570 litres of storage space between its two compartments, 150 more than a 570 GT. Airflow runs between the engine bay and the rear compartment to stop your luggage getting hot. McLaren says you'll fit two pairs of skis in that compartment or a full set of golf clubs. The GT is 20 centimetres longer than a Sport Series McLaren, which is where that extra luggage space comes from. So it's a big load space that's really useful. It's just a slightly odd shape. You've got these nets and these straps here to tie your stuff down and stop it flying into the cabin when you stand on the brakes. The engine sits right there and it clearly kicks out a lot of heat. So why doesn't it just melt your golf clubs? Well, that's because McLaren has worked really, really hard to insulate this area, the boot space, from the heat of the engine. There are some very trick foams in there and heat reflective materials. Now they've tested it to extremes. They've driven this car through Death Valley when it was cooking, something like 35 degrees C, maybe even hotter than that, with the engine working really hard. The idea being that when it's that hot outside and the engine is working that hard down in there, this area shouldn't get hotter than 40 degrees C. The melting point of chocolate is 37 degrees C, so only when it's really hot outside and you're working the engine extremely hard is your dairy milk going to melt. Now, this car is fast. Maybe not fighter jet fast, but it's fast. The GT uses McLaren's torquier 4-litre twin-turbo V8 rather than the 3.8-litre. It's rated at 630 horsepower and 465 pounds foot. McLaren quotes a 0 to 62 time of 3.2 seconds and a top speed of 203 miles per hour. At 1,530 kilograms, the GT is 35 kilograms heavier than the 570 GT. It costs from 163,000 pounds. So this GT might be something a bit new for McLaren, but to sit in, it just feels classic McLaren to me. This whole dashboard, this sculptural dashboard form and these door cards, that's just borrowed from the Sport Series models, it's very familiar now. The seating position, that's McLaren through and through as well. This very lovely thin rim steering wheel reaches right out and there are no controls on it whatsoever. Still got that very low scuttle which gives you that panoramic view through the windscreen. You sit low, you sit reclined, your legs way out in front of you. So this all feels very, very familiar to any McLaren driver. It's a light, airy cabin, but it's only when you look over your shoulder and see that enormous load space in the back do you realize you're driving something a little bit different. These gear shift paddles, cool to the touch, they're metal. I think they're great. In other models, they're plastic or carbon fiber, and they feel a little bit brittle here. They're lovely and tactile. 
This GT debuts a new infotainment system for McLaren, which we'll be seeing on other models soon enough. Now, until now, McLaren's infotainment system has been patchy at best. This is a new, much more powerful one that's modeled on a smartphone and it's intuitive to use, really easy to navigate. The touch screen isn't quite as responsive as your smartphone's is, but it's a good step on from the infotainment system in existing McLarens. What's also very familiar is this active panel down here where you can use these rotating knobs to choose your handling and powertrain settings. And as we'll find when we start moving, they really make a massive difference. This is the road where that very questionable James Bond GoldenEye car chase was shot. Do you remember that? Right now, I'm just driving this GT with everything set to comfort mode. Because with this car, it's really important to discuss comfort and refinement and usability for a carbon tubbed car to isolate road noise as well as this. It's really impressive. So we've got excellent ride quality as well. Dampers in their softest setting and it's just so fluid these dampers they try to read the road predict what's coming up and that just helps to calm and settle the ride quality but now mclaren is rightly very proud of the work it's done on nvh with this car noise vibration and harshness refinement to you and i because rather than being a fizzy loud ticky sort of car in the cabin it's actually super settled super refined there's hardly any tyre noise. So all of that stuff just means that the McLaren GT is such a relaxing car to spend time in. But that's enough of all that stuff. I've told you everything I want to tell you about quietness and ride comfort. I'm gonna turn everything up and tell you what this car's like to drive when you really start giving it death. So I've got the handling in sport and the powertrain in track mode, powertrain in track mode, because that's where you get the fastest gear shifts, the best throttle response, the most energetic engine handling in sport mode because in track mode it's just a little bit fidgety, a little bit jiggly. Initially it just feels so McLaren, partly because you're sat in it the way you sit in any other McLaren, partly because the powertrain behaves in much the same way. But when you really dig into the detail, actually there are some significant differences between say this and a 570 GT. There's steering for instance. This car still has hydraulic steering but they've clearly tuned it to be very different to the steering in other McLarens. They've retuned the steering to be much calmer, much less connected so there's far less noise coming back through the steering wheel and of course there's a trade-off there and it means that this car doesn't have that super communicative, hyper-accurate steering that other McLarens do. It's still good, it's still better than most E-Pass systems, but it's a shame to drive a McLaren that doesn't have that hyper-connected steering feel. So handling, still feels agile, still feels alert and responsive. McLaren wants the GT to be the most dynamic car in the Grand Tourer class and it's lighter than something like a DBS Superleggera, got better weight distribution than a DBS Superleggera and so it does feel dynamic and responsive in a way even that car doesn't. But compared to other McLarens of course again there's a trade-off with all that ride comfort, all that noise suppression, a bit of extra weight yeah, it doesn't feel as alert as other McLarens. So what are you feeling, apart from the fact that the steering is just a little bit muted? There isn't quite the sheer mechanical grip that you get from other models. These P0 tyres, they bite hard, but you just feel them starting to bleed out earlier than a more aggressive, grippier tyre would. Those tyres probably also influence the way the steering feels and how sharply the car dives into an apex just a slight hint of laziness and when you flick the car between two quick direction changes that's where you feel it just hauling one way to the other whereas a more focused McLaren has none of that lethargy it just snaps one direction to the other you also feel the front end washing just ever so slightly in a corner 
it's not really understeering as such, but you're conscious that it's not holding exactly the right line, I think it's still really good to drive. For me, something with the engine in the middle, something with 630 horsepower, something with a McLaren badge on the nose, it still has to stack up as a supercar. Yeah, I know, this GT is a Grand Tourer, but just look at it, it's still got to work as a supercar, hasn't it? And I think it mostly does. You can still hammer it along a winding mountain road and have a great time doing it. It's just nowhere near as alert and as responsive as McLaren's more focused models. That's to be expected. In technical terms, the powertrain configuration is new because it's the bigger four litre engine, but with a level of power that we haven't yet seen from a McLaren before, 630 horsepower. So it is, in a way, bespoke to this GT, but it just feels so familiar. It's, a, it's an engine that thrives on revs, whereas the 3.9 litre twin turbo unit in the F8 Tributo has got amazing throttle response and a really good mid-range. This engine actually doesn't do much below 4,000 RPM. You put your foot down and it takes a deep breath, you let the revs rise, and when it gets through 4,000, then it really starts to fly. And my God, it does that rocket ship thing where everything goes warp speed in your peripheral vision. It feels so fast. And then unlike a lot of turbo engines, this one has got a really good top end. It just rips around to eight and a half thousand RPM or so. It's a bassier soundtrack to other McLarens. There's a bit more V8 rumble to it. So it adds a nice little hint of character that I quite like. But it is frustrating, this engine, when you're coming around a very, very tight hairpin and you drop off boost, even in second gear. So there isn't that super sharp throttle response that you get from a Ferrari or from the Mercedes twin turbo four litre V8. And it means that you can't really adjust the car on the throttle with the same precision as you can other comparable cars. The gearbox is good, it's perhaps not the most responsive one now, it's a few years old, but it still works really well. You're not wanting for extra response or faster gear shifts. There are many good things about this car and other things that aren't so good. The McLaren GT lacks some identity. It is far more refined and civilized than the conventional McLaren supercar, but it's also far less exciting to drive. I have no doubt many owners will think it's wonderful, but for me, a Grand Tour should be dripping with character and powered by a mighty 12-cylinder engine, while a supercar should be agile and exquisitely responsive. The GT is neither, and nor does it really challenge my idea of what a Grand Tour should be. Me, I'll stick with the sublime McLaren 600 LT. Thank you very much. Let us know which one you'd have in the comments. Make sure you subscribe to the Pistonheads YouTube channel and turn on notifications. Oh, and visit pistonheads.com as well. It's the only car website you'll ever need.